Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. One of the most universally hated individuals in today's society is the bureaucrat. Bureaucracy for most people is a dirty word. It represents a faceless system that treats you not as individuals, but as a number or entry point in ledger books. It's an unfeeling and flexible system that oftentimes overcomplicates what should be a simple task. And that's only on Earth, where we only have like a few layers of government, ranging from your local municipality to the federal level. Heck, we don't even have a unified planetary government yet. And so if you think bureaucracy is crazy here on Earth, just imagine how crazy bureaucracy can be in a galaxy where the governments begin at the planetary level and scale up all the way to the galactic government. This is bureaucracy at a scale that is simply unimaginable for most people. But just like here on Earth, the word bureaucracy is a dirty word, and it's been used as a scapegoat for many of the ailments that ordinary people suffer through in the Republic or Empire on a daily basis. Before we continue, though, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Factor. How much time do you spend every week going to the grocery store, cooking, and cleaning afterwards? I'm sure it's a lot of time, and who has time in today's busy world? That's where Factor comes into play. It's a gourmet food service that provides healthy and well-balanced pre-cooked meals for your daily needs, which can be prepared in just about two minutes. All you gotta do is open up your box, take one of these meals that are never frozen, and you pop it in the microwave, and boom, you're done. I've already ordered Factor a few times, and this time around I got jalapeno lime cheddar chicken, chipotle rub pork chop, green pepper and beef casserole, roasted veggie and pesto tortellini, Tuscan tomato chicken and spinach, and mushroom chicken thighs. Factor spends a lot of time focusing on customer needs, and so they're ready to meet a wide range of dietary needs and tastes. They have keto options, flexitarian options, vegan and veggie options, or if you just wanna go ham on the protein, there's that option as well. You can also choose from a list of various add-ons like lunch on the go, snacks, juice, they even have breakfast. And for this autumn, they have some amazing seasonal offerings like pecan chicken and honey Dijon pork chops. And so if you guys are tired of bland and unhealthy food or just want to save a few hours in the day for things you actually want to do, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use our code GENTECH50, that's all caps, to get 50% off of your first Factor box. All right, thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. When Queen Amidala's Naboo people were getting slaughtered and starved to death by the Trade Federation droid army, instead of being met with aid or intervention by the federal government, all Chancellor Finis Valorum could authorize was a Senate subcommittee to investigate the situation and come up with a report that the Senate would use at a later date to decide what to do. Enter the bureaucrats, the true rulers of the Republic, and on the payroll of the Trade Federation, I might add. This is where Chancellor Valorum's strength will disappear. Now let me decipher that whispered quote. You see, Senator Palpatine was a Sith Lord, and he had been secretly guiding the Trade Federation into more and more egregious behavior. Palpatine played on the greed of the leaders of the Trade Federation and steered them towards taking on riskier and riskier behavior, which of course drew the attention of the Republic. The federal government is a slow system. It's supposed to be impartial. It's supposed to look at both sides of a conflict and make its decision only after it is properly educated about what's happening. The problem is this takes time. And when you're the queen of Naboo, you don't really have that much time. And so for the Republic, it's not just enough to hear the first-hand accounts of Queen Amidala and her people's suffering. The Republic wants to create a Senate subcommittee to carry out an official investigation. The Senate wants the proper information to create the proper response for this incident. And this is really how government works when it becomes more and more layered, when bureaucracy is involved. You can't just make decisions based on hunches or emotions. I mean, what if Queen Amidala was lying? What if she wasn't this immensely ethical individual that we all know her as? What if the Naboo were hiding something? What if the situation were more complicated and the Naboo government was indebted to the Trade Federation and if the company didn't collect its debts, then other debtors could be inspired to miss their payments and that could spur on a financial crisis which would actually cause a lot more damage for everyone in the galaxy. We the fans know that Queen Amidala is right and that our cause is just, we've seen the Phantom Menace, but that's not enough for government bodies. They can't just rely on other people's words, they need to investigate things thoroughly for themselves. And that's because the government in theory is supposed to serve the people, and they serve the people by collecting resources from all of us and then reallocating it to various 
um, you know, departments and organizations that are supposed to provide service. And so when the government spends money, they have to be very careful where that money is going. A lot of energy is actually placed into this. A private company has a lot more leeway on what they can do with their capital. Even a publicly traded company that is beholden to its shareholders only needs to report what it's doing like once a quarter. And even then there is an agreement that the CEO is more or less allowed to do what it wants to do to create short-term or even long-term growth. Now take a look at NASA. For them to build a rocket, the funding and allocation of resources needs to be approved way ahead of time, down to all the individual technologies and components used on the rocket. If there's a 10-year developmental cycle for a project, it's very likely they spent years just coming up with that plan and allocating where all the funds will go in the first place. And so any major changes would take an extraordinary long time because of the approval process and all the paperwork involved. Private firms like SpaceX, on the other hand, can swap in proprietary tech, explore new technologies, and fail, wasting millions millions of dollars and still be okay as long as the company's financials are solid. SpaceX is far more innovative because of this ability to take risks and have less red tape. In Palpatine's words to Padme Amidala kind of plays off of this dynamic. The bureaucrats he claims are the true rulers of the Republic. What he does with this line is basically bunch together a diverse group of representatives who have sworn an oath to represent the interests of the various systems they hail from. The idea is these representatives are supposed to rule by committee. They're supposed to debate and compromise and find solutions that will work for everyone involved. And that's usually okay for most problems, for most solutions. But again, when people are dying on your home world, you really just can't wait for that. This is the core of what a democracy is though. And when seen in action, it never really is a pretty thing. And that's because in democracies, voices that you might be against or hate are going to be represented. And sometimes compromise and solutions are impossible to reach. And that's when people like Palpatine really shine. They present an alternative. They hate ruling by committee. They hate compromise. They want all the power for themselves. And so Palpatine will constantly challenge the basic aspects of a democracy. He picks apart and highlights its weaknesses purposely in order to prove a point. And take a look at people beneath Palpatine's influence, like Anakin Skywalker, who's been secretly mentored by the politician from a very young age. Anakin has developed a very negative view of the political world. As a Jedi, he often has a very clear view for what was right or wrong, and he often acted before he thought a situation through. And so he's naturally against this idea of elite politicians and bureaucrats creating a system of rules and regulations that force people to think before acting. I don't think the system works. How would you have it work? You know, it's really easy to point out problems with a system or problems with people who are actually trying to operate and run a government. As a YouTuber who intimately understands the algorithm and how it exploits human psychology and our fears, I understand that negativity will always sell better. It'll get you more views, voters, whatever you want. I mean, ideally, if I wanna get views on YouTube as a Star Wars YouTuber, what I should be talking about is how evil Kathleen Kennedy is, how she hates male uh, Star Wars fans. I should be making videos about how Disney is evil or, or how Star Wars is evil. It should just be constant negativity. And that's because even though viewers might not share these views, that negative emotion they see from the title is what attracts their attention. In the same way, a political campaign that focuses just on negativity and destroying the government and saying how, oh, America is terrible, we need to change everything, fix everything, is going to be a lot more successful than a campaign about fixing things, about talking about healthcare reform, about, I don't know, reforming our immigration system, reforming our military and how it gives out contracts, for instance. These are all very complicated subjects that are actually far more constructive in how they approach governing than just I hate everything about government and we need to destroy it all. But the problem is good policy is less emotional and it's oftentimes far more complex. You have to talk about many moving parts and structures. You have to talk about things that most people just aren't interested in, let's be honest. And due to the political nature of our system, you know, people are willing to use populism to attack everything and anything to just gain power. And lo and behold, what happens when these type of individuals who just try to destroy get into power, they're completely incapable of governance. And since the United States has such a low voter turnout, winning elections is not just about converting the existing pool of voters to your ideology or policies. It's also about targeting people who might have never been involved in politics in the first place and convincing them to vote for the first time. 
And these people are generally more politically naive and they're a lot more vulnerable to populist rhetoric. You know, if I ran a political campaign and I said, I'm gonna wipe out all taxes and I'm gonna destroy the IRS, it will get a lot of support. No one likes taxes. No one wants to deal with an overly bureaucratic entity like the IRS. But it would actually be morally wrong for me to say this because of the role that taxes play in our government and the role that the IRS plays in our society. As a government official, it would be my job to serve the populace and by getting rid of essential infrastructure like this, which funds everything from our military to our local townships, I would actually be inflicting a great amount of suffering and damage to the populace. And so these populace political leaders who only see negativity are great at protesting and opposing things, but they often have no idea what to do when they're actually in power. Emperor Palpatine is a great example of this. He not only made the galaxy a more dangerous and imbalanced place, he destroyed the one system that actually worked quite well in the old Republic, and that was the economy, and he replaced it with a military-first economic system that created poor outcomes for almost everyone in the galaxy. You know, the next time you see one of these individuals who just wants to tear everything down, who's against the entire political system against the bureaucrats, just ask them what they would do if they were in charge. And oftentimes, this is what you'll get. How would you have it work? We need a system where the politicians sit down and discuss the problem, agree what's in the best interest of all the people, and then do it. Democracies look amazing on paper, and I think most people uh, in a democratic country have a very idealistic and naive view of how politics work. And when they finally get involved in the political world, they become disheartened by just how cruel and vicious it can look. But this is the reality of politics. It's always been a dirty, dirty system. And I think, you know, Padme Amidala, who has been a politician since she was a teenager, really understands this. But she embraces the chaos that is politics, but chooses to still fight for good, which is what you want. That's exactly what we do. The, the trouble is that people don't always agree. Padme is being exceptionally kind here. Uh, she's talking to Anakin like he's a child, and she understands where he's coming from being a politician for as long as she has. I think a lot of people share this view that Anakin has. And this is how oftentimes free countries also lose their democracy and become dictatorships. If you don't have an educated populace, one that understands the nuances of the political system, it can be very easy to create populist narratives like the one Palpatine is trying to create. Enter the bureaucrats, the true rulers of the Republic, and on the payroll of the Trade Federation, I might add. This is where Chancellor Valorum's strength will disappear. Now listen to the second part of Palpatine's line here, the part about Finis Valorum. It's very clear what Palpatine's overall objective and philosophy is. He believes that the bureaucrats, aka the Senate, have too much power, and that the executive branch does not have enough power. It's a popular ideology we're seeing a lot of dictators used to basically take over democracies all across our world. It's a rejection of the compromise that the legislative branch is supposed to create. The idea is all about subverting the power of this branch of government and allowing the executive branch to just completely take over. And it's something we've been dealing with here in the United States for quite some time as well. Did you know the last time the United States officially declared war on another country? was in 1942. That's when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. At the time, the country was supremely united behind the U.S. military and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and we declared war on the Axis powers. But the Korean War that happened just years later, that was officially a police action that the U.S. partook in along with the U.N. Vietnam was another police action designed to stop the spread of communism. Iraq and Afghanistan weren't wars, but campaigns against terrorism. And all of these conflicts were not started by the Senate, but by an executive order. The interesting thing is while some conflicts that were started using this executive loophole, like the first Gulf War, were ultimately successful and had positive outcomes, most of these conflicts are now seen as very controversial and very detrimental to America's economy, society, to its overall image in the world. And so it goes to show you that using executive privilege to override the Senate might not always be a good thing choice. Now, in the last few decades, both Democrats and Republican presidents have been lawyered up like crazy doing research into our legal system, trying to figure out ways to circumvent a hostile Senate or just a Senate who won't cooperate. And in their defense, there are situations like the blockade of Naboo, where you just can't wait for months to figure out what's going on. Sometimes you have to make a decision and make it quick. 
And in some cases, using executive privilege seems to work quite well. I mean, take a look at the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. The sheer amount of risk involved in this mission, along with the limited window for when they could carry out this operation, meant that a public debate in the legislature would have been impossible. Same thing goes for the mission to kill Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I guess the challenge is balancing when you use executive power and when you rely on the legislative, which is really how most laws should be carried through with cooperation, with compromise, with various parties involved. The bureaucracy can be an easy target to hit. It's not easy to defend something that is so universally hated. I openly admit I hate any interaction I have with my government, state, local, uh, you know, federal. I just try to avoid it as much as possible, but I begrudgingly admit that without the bureaucrats, we would just have complete chaos in society. The whole idea about civilization, about having a government, is that we agree to share resources and hopefully see those resources used in an optimal way that can benefit the most amount of people. In order to make such shared systems work, you do need rules, regulations, and standards that we can all agree upon. Our social security system, for instance, can't just work on an honor system. We can't just rely on families to take care of the elderly. And so we create this system with all these rules and regulations that make sure that everyone has a little bit of money put away for their own future. Now, listen, I'll be honest with you. I've called uh, social security a Ponzi scheme, and I kind of believe in that. But I also believe that it's better than nothing, guys. It really is. Or let's make things simpler. Take a Starship purchase. Why do you have to register your ship and turn on the transponder? It's the same reason why everyone else has to. So that if a crime is committed with that ship, it's easier to track down that individual who is responsible. Otherwise, what stops people from just randomly buying ships and using them for crimes or ramming them into things at hyperspace speeds? And so the next time you open your mouth to curse the government or the IRS or the Republic, as I oftentimes do, take a moment and really think about it. Think about for a second what the world would look like without any government, without any rules or regulations. Understand that bureaucracy, which is maligned in much of the world and a lot of fiction and a lot of franchises like Star Wars, is a completely necessary evil. Palpatine was right about the bureaucrats running the galaxy. They run all the systems and organizations that the rest of us don't want to deal with. You think government's main job is to just like declare war and send nukes against people or you know take part in this culture war? Now, most of the things that the government does is completely unseen, behind the scenes, and it's what keeps things in order on a day-to-day -day basis, which what keeps the grocery shelves filled. It's what keeps medicine relatively safe for consumers. Again, all of these systems have a lot of holes poked into them, and that is thanks to the rise of social media. But the thing is, what we now have are a huge amount of people who don't actually understand how these systems work, but they do understand enough to criticize those systems without actually giving us any good constructive criticism. It's just all negativity. And therefore, no one trusts the institutions that used to protect and govern our society. And so being a bureaucrat is the most thankless job in the galaxy, especially today, when no one really seems to understand what they do and what value they bring. When Palpatine got rid of the Republic and replaced it with the Empire, he got rid of clones and Venator-class Star Destroyers. He got rid of the Jedi as well. But the one thing he couldn't get rid of was the Republic-era bureaucracy. If anything, the Empire's bureaucratic network was even larger and more convoluted. And so guys, don't trust political leaders that feed you emotion, that feed you just straight negativity. Yes, you might agree with them, but listen closely. Do they actually have a solution for all the problems they talked about? Because if they don't, when they get in power, we're all going to be screwed. So at the end of the day, we need constructive criticism, not just criticism for criticism's sake. At the end of the day, as much as I hate bureaucracy, I realize we need it. And we need political leaders who want to reform our bureaucratic systems and make them better. Not make them larger or smaller, but better. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. See you next time.